about myself. I'm a maritime archaeologist in training. In tra yes, in training. Um, I've been with Historic England for nearly five years now, uh, mostly mainly working in uh, marine planning. So if you have any questions on designation, I'd be very happy to direct you to my listings colleagues. I probably won't know the answer. Um, <coughs> I've been dealing with uh, aggregates and wind farms because that's most of what our marine planning business is. Um, but also I have a bit of an interest, personal interest, in coastal archaeology. So, uh, Historic Union Works, as hopefully you all know, uh, as the archaeological curator, or heritage advisor if you prefer, for the regulatory authorities for marine licensing, both the marine, marine management organisation, but also the planning inspectorate. And this gives us a unique engagement with developments, from their inception, through their delivery, and even into their eventual decommissioning. Working within the planning legislation, such as the UK Marine Policy Statement, it is our role to ensure that adequate consideration and protection of the his marine historic environment is, is achieved, and also to achieve the maximum public benefits from such schemes. So today, I wanted to present to you what our perspective is of what we think public benefits can be from such schemes, and how the Historic England actively contributes towards them. I wanted to focus my presentation on offshore wind developments, as it's an ever-increasing body of work for us, but it also presents the greatest challenges and the greatest opportunities for both offshore archaeology in general and Historic England as the archaeological curator. So, what does Historic England see as the legacy of public benefits from offshore renewables? So in broad terms, I've simpl simplified this down to three key elements. Data, knowledge and learning, and collaboration. As I talk through these three elements, I hope it becomes apparent that whilst they might not always seem particularly beneficial in and of themselves, together they can help to create a positive feedback loop from which tangible benefits can be seen. So first up, you've got data. As we've already heard today, one of the most visible legacies from the point of our view as a creator from offshore renewable projects is the vast quantity of data that is being collected over covering large parts of England's offshore areas, particularly, as we've already discussed, in the North Sea. Now, I don't plan on going into great detail on the data as others have previously covered it much better than I could, um, but what I do want to emphasise is that it's clear from the size but also the spread of the projects that have already been consented and built, that there is a vast potential for archaeological research here, both for paleolandscape studies, but also for wreck sites. And with the ever-growing list of future developments planned, with round four and round three extensions upcoming, to help achieve, to help achieve the UK's uh, carbon reduction commitments, this potential is only ever going to increase, as more areas of the seabed are not only being surveyed, but being surveyed in great detail. Further to this, as schemes are passing beyond the point of commercial sensitivity, as we've already discussed today, um, i.e. they have been built, the data in the reports from the wind farms are becoming much more publicly available via repositories such as the ADS and the Marine Data Exchange, and therefore available to the archaeological community as a whole for further research. So how does Historic England contribute to the collection and dissemination of this data? Well, one of the main things we do is we review method statements and survey specifications and other project documents throughout all stages of the projects to make sure that the methodologies are acceptable for the collection of data for archaeological purposes against a basic standard method, minimum standard. This has been a huge development over the last decade or so from wind farm developments, where we've gone from um, simply being dependent on the developers for any data that as a byproduct we might be able to use for archaeological assessment, to influencing the way that survey methodologies are put together and ensuring that archaeological objectives are 
put into the designer surveys at the very start, allowing for not only the good collection of good quality data, but also on occasions data for the collection, collection of archaeological purposes solely. So yeah, as I say, so this means that the data is, is great for us to inform our mitigation strategies uh, against the impacts from development, but also increasingly it is highly suitable for archaeological research against established research frameworks. The second main part of our input in this aspect relates to the advice we would provide regarding licensing conditions. And let me tell you, this is something we do work really, really hard on, um, to try and make sure that the data that is collected is retained, but it is also reported and archived to ensure that the value of information that is collected through the project's license, lifetime is not only preserved, but made available to the general public, eventually. So my second benefit from offshore wind developments I've called knowledge and learning, which refers to two equally important but very different things. <coughs> First of all, you have knowledge gained during the development process that furthers public knowledge of both archaeological investigation and specific chronological periods. Secondly, you have the learning within not only Historic England, but also the developers themselves and their consultants about how these projects develop. So starting with knowledge, what I'm referring to here is the information that is gained regarding archaeological deposits and features in reference to best practice and recognised codes and standards such as CFAs that's collected through offshore wind developments and is perhaps one of the most obvious benefits of the collection and interpretation of such a vast quantity of survey data. The offshore wind industry has heavily contributed to the large swaths of the UK's waters that have now been subjected to some level of survey and in some areas surveyed in high detail and great resolution with bathymetry, side scan, sub-bottom profiler, but also pause. On top of this, these data sets have also been subjected to an archaeological analysis and interpretation as a part of the development process. This has allowed for large areas of the sea to be examined for both paleolandscapes and maritime and aviation losses, with new sites being found and detailed information that's gained from the data, which can also be added to the public record. This has led to a number of papers being written based on the findings of such investigations. And in some notable cases, uh, for instance, uh, a certain somebody in this room's prehistoric landscape audit, hi Louise, um, on a scale that simply wouldn't be possible without the collection of industry data. Of course, the knowledge also assists us as a curator in our, in, in our job to manage the historic environment resource offshore throughout the development process and beyond. And so again, we therefore work to get provisions within licensing conditions to enable the interpretation of the data to be conducted to a high standard to be, and to be archived for future research. But also, we work to try and get publications out by the teams who are undertaking the analysis themselves, such as the 2018 publication of Boreholes from Dutch and Offshore Wind Farm. So the second part of, this, of my second benefit is learning, dropping new papers. Um, so the, as we've already previously discussed, the offshore renewable industry has now become a mature industry with more than 10 years of development knowledge, not only with the developers, but also with archaeological contractors and with us, the curator. Impacts from these developments are now well understood, allowing for mitigation, mitigation measures applied to be effective and proportionate. This is demonstrated through the growing body of guidance that's available, which themselves are now well established and routinely referenced documents. Not only this, but our expectations for the consideration and protection of archaeological material and remains in, on or under the seabed is now well understood by the majority of industry players, with established mitigation measures standardised and acknowledged by all parties as appropriate. It's our long-term commitment to early and continuous engagement with projects throughout their development, construction, operation and eventual decommissioning further down the line that 
contributes to this learning process. And therefore, hopefully, the quality of the data and its analysis from day one. Our engagement has also helped us to have a cultural influence on the industry through our advice, but also the advice uh, from archaeological consultants. There is now embedded knowledge within contractors, project managers and project staff. And this helps to engender genuine interest from the industry members, which can lead them to try and go beyond their basic consent requirements and achieve more. And this is something that we actively engage, encourage. Thus, the more archaeological investigation and research that is achieved through developments as a result of this learning process, the more knowledge is gained for the public record, which also in turn helps future projects in their baseline data, their mitigation and their impact set assessments, something that is now starting to be realised with the fruition of multiple projects within the same area being taken forward by the same developer. So one of the examples already given today was some of the East Anglian offshore wind farms such as Fat uh, Batfield Vanguard, but also you have the Hornsea offshore wind zone, which is now starting their fourth development. And this process of using our learning to develop our knowledge from the data is greatly assisted by my third element, collaboration. If industry representatives and archaeological contractors are on the same page as us in terms of what we protect and how we protect it, it allows us the time and the ability throughout the development to engage in further discussions on collaborative efforts to push the beneficial gains from projects beyond the basic consent requirements. Now the level of engagement is often based on goodwill, but it can also be seen as mutually beneficial. We, the archaeologists, get further information and the dissemination of important archaeological information, and they, the industry, get the good news story of the positive benefits and be seen to be actively engaging with us within the planning regime. As you obviously might understand, this doesn't occur for every site and every project, but there are some success stories to be told. And it's something we are keen to continue and expand on, not only with, with offshore wind, but also other offshore industry sectors and offshore agency partners. It is this collaboration that takes the data collected, the analysis undertaken, allowing for real public benefits in terms of our knowledge and understanding to be made and shared, which should be a key goal for all archaeologists. Opportunities can also be quite unexpected. As an example, uh, I was recently invited to join MMT on deep sea archaeological investigations. Now, as a survey contractor, they've worked on many UK uh, wind farms, including Dudgeon and Race Bank. But they also have a keen interest in archaeology, which has led to their, their involvement in large research projects with university researchers and even undertaking their own wreck investigations, all of which has been developed through their contact with archaeologists, both researchers and curators. But a crucial part of this is being open to opportunities and to think outside the box. For instance, there's been a, a recent development of coastal funds from wind, wind farms, which hold a great potential, as well as a pot of cash, for those with the enthusiasm to pursue opportunities. For example, there's an East Coast fund set up by Orsted in 2016, which makes nearly £400,000 available each year for the community and our environmental projects. And as I've already hinted at, there are examples of where these elements have come together to enable public benefits to be realised. I've mentioned a couple already, but here are some other examples that are worth a mention too. So first up, we have the uh, Gallica Karakamilica Bell. So the Karakamilica was a Yugoslavian flagship that went down uh, in the Second World War, I believe. And during UXO surveys of the export cable for Gallica offshore wind farm, uh, some anomalies were found, including one that turned out on inspection to be the ship's bell. So, and this was in an area that was going to be impacted by the development. And so it was agreed in consultation with Historic England for the bell to be recovered, and it's now been deposited with the Sunderland Museum, and the NRHE records have been updated as a result of these works. Secondly, as I've previously mentioned, is the Dudgeon Offshore Wind Farm. 
uh, there was a publication of boreholes collected in 2018, 2013. As we previously discussed about um, how long it can take this information to get out to the public realm, it took five years for the publication to occur in 2018. And this was guided by the two, regional, two separate regional science advisors, as well as the Marine Planning Unit. And these calls were able to provide new detailed evidence on the vegetation and environmental changes within this area of the Southern North Sea over the late glacial and Holocene periods. And lastly, we have the Xanthony and the Seagull. Now these two wrecks were originally surveyed by the Regional Environmental Characterization, but further data was collected on these sites by the Vattenfall Vanguard project, which has now led to them being, um, their significance being recognized and they are now on the list to be assessed for designation. All of these three examples demonstrate how we can use the data and a bit of collaboration to enable new information to be brought into the public realm. Which brings me neatly on to looking forward to the future. So collaboration is one of the key areas in which we are looking to pursue further with those minded to engage with us. And this is not restricted to just offshore industries, but also other government agencies such as the JNCC and the MCA. <coughs> Uh, and for instance, we have actually already worked with the JNCA to collect data on RECs for our management purposes that they collected on our behalf during their surveys. So this was quite a positive achievement. Further, as part of our own nursing, uh, learning process, process, we have identified ways in which SOGOSI could include further provision to work towards our goals. So this is to include such things as a more detailed survey log and analysis of work that has been undertaken, to help facilitate long-term engagement with the changing of personnel between projects um, on all, for all parties, but also the inclusion of post-construction monitoring for the effectiveness of AEZs um, to further our understanding of impacts. And lastly, of course, more wind farms means more data. The industry is still marching on in the UK's bid to reduce carbon emissions and create cleaner, more sustainable energy sources. With the increasing size and distance offshore and new extensions as well as new areas being developed, new projects will each present a unique opportunity for archaeology, including the discussion of the creative thinking, adaptation to different areas, and the number of anomalies that are being discovered that could be included within research publications to demonstrate how problems were solved and methods deployed. And England and the UK are not isolated in this respect. Other North Sea countries are also making great strides in offshore wind, and the rest of the world is catching up too. 